So I'm going to be hopefully presenting a little bit of an algorithm, uh, a little, a little bit of some of some of the things that I've learned over the years, and and hopefully presenting to you a little bit of a nerve transfer bias because that's I guess what people are expecting to hear from me, but within the context of the, the tendon transfer history. So nerve transfers have all they've done is expanded our reconstructive options. Um, we've got new donors um, added to the pool that we had available to us uh, through tendon transfers. They are advantageous because they allow direct reanimation of muscles that were biomechanically designed to do that specific function. And uh, they are able to reanimate more than one muscle per transfer. As a general comment, they require smaller incisions and shorter periods of immobilization, and, and, and patients are really tempted by, by that when we, when we discuss the pros and cons. They can be used as an alternative to tendons or in combination with tendons, even, even onto the same function. And if you choose your nerve transfers correctly, you can keep your, your usual tendon donors intact to use in secondary surgery for augmentation or for salvage. These are some of my uh, perspectives, um, just some general overall comments about operating on people who are living with tetraplegia. Um, the first starting up almost at 12, 11 o'clock, and we've known this for a long time, but I say it again in the context of nerve transfers, that all nerve transfers do better in lower level cervical spinal cord injury. The same nerve transfer does better in the lower level patient. Don't try and even compare your own outcomes for the same transfer in different level patients. Function is more important than power and range. Of course we knew that. Um, but also remember that in the patient who has tetraplegia, the lower MRC grades and, and sometimes even not full range of motion can still be functional and should not be disregarded. Interestingly, it's not just superior power, but it's superior function does not necessarily translate into more independence. And we actually find that our patients that, uh, that have more need, that are less supported sometimes by a family or um, by their insurance, uh, by carers, that actually are the most independent of our patients. Satisfaction is a, is a function of expectation and not again of strength or ability. So setting those expectations correctly is very important, but it's not just us that are failing. If our patient gets a great uh, result and they think that it's bad, it's actually their expectations of themselves. And when you're dealing with a high level athlete, for example, to start, who's used to just doing better than everyone else and just assumes they're gonna do better than everyone else because that's what they, how they normally roll in life, and then they are limited by the reality of their spinal cord inju injury, they can be dissatisfied. Be careful when offer offering surgery to patients who are many years post-injury. And if you do, understand exactly how they are using their upper limb. So you don't change it in your mind, potentially making it more powerful, but, but they've got ways of doing things that you may not appreciate and you will, change, you will change that for them and potentially make things worse for them. People with tetraplegia use every tiny improvement you can make for them. Spasticity may, may help if you've got some tone in your finger flexors. It's not always a bad thing, but it may also hinder function and you just need to take it into consideration and work out whether it's, it's, it's doing you know, either of those two things. Patients are difficult to get back to secondary surgery because going back, um, so try and do as much as you can in the first instance because going back means another admission, another period of dependence, and that, that triggering experience of being back in hospital and dependent. If you're choosing a patient for a nerve transfer, what, what's the ideal patient? So if you're gonna start doing this, you wanna, you wanna pick the winners to begin with. So they are to do with patient selection, donor nerve health, nerve transfer selection, and timing. Patient selection, you want a cooperative, motivated, light-limbed and supple-jointed patient with a lower level of injury, C6, um, international classification 4. Your donor nerve needs to be healthy. It needs to be an MRC grade 5 muscle, not a recovered muscle. All right, It's always been strong. Uh, looks good on the EMG, one or two fibrillations, normal or reduced rec recruitment, not markedly reduced or discrete recruitment. 
When you're stimulating that nerve intraoperatively, you are reassured when you see that your donor nerve stimulates at a low threshold and makes a good movement through the full range um, that that muscle uh, produces on the joint. And you don't want any additional um, donor nerve injury from a, an additional brachial plexus injury or a compression injury. With nerve transfer um, selection, you want to choose a, a nerve transfer that's as close to target as you can. And if you can provide two nerve transfers to somehow uh, reconstruct the same function, then please do. Um, earlier is better. We, in our complete patients, we're aiming around the six month mark. Um, that means that our recipient nerve and muscle is healthier. There's been less degeneration of the neuromuscular interface. And again, um, you know, uh, the, 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 you, on the recipient nerve, if you do have low stimulation thresholds and good movement and stimulation, we have shown, and all of those sort of highlighted ones, um, you can read about in that paper that I've listed there, that we actually managed to show an, actually an MRC uh, improvement in the patients that were better in those variables. These are our reconstructive priorities, elbow extension, you either need it or you don't, so you, you, you reconstruct it if you do. And then wrist extension is our first priority. And then pinch and grasp, not grasp and pinch, pinch and grasp. Pinch comes before grasp in terms of your priority. Hand opening and then intrinsic function, I put it fourth, but it really is tied in with those other uh, two, two and three. We've, um, Carolyn's presented uh, beautifully how this uh, works, and so I won't go into that any further, but it is important when you're choosing your reconstructions, particularly in, in, um, in grasp and pinch. We uh, initially described uh, triple nerve transfer, which was, was based on, on previous nerve transfers that had been described, but just sort of a case report put them together um, as a single operation in order to try and reconstruct all of our usual things that we were trying to reconstruct, elbow extension, um, uh, pinch grasp and hand opening in a tetraplegic patient, but without losing any of our tendon donors so that we could go back and salvage if we needed to. And this patient is demonstrating all of those uh, reconstructed functions, elbow extensioning, hand opening and grasp. Now I want to talk about the various components. So we'll start with elbow extension. So if you've got a triceps MRC of zero, one, or even a two with less than full range of motion at about six months, you need to do a reconstruction. So you do a tendon or you do a nerve. Um, coming back to that slide before the ideal patient, that for a nerve transfer, that's really important for triceps. You want them early, you want them low, no recovered donors and light limbs. And if you've got that, that might be the, a good patient to start for your first nerve transfer for triceps. We don't do bilateral tendon transfers because we put them in the Bledsoe brace afterwards and we find that uh, we don't have the ability to manage them post-op with two arms like that out of action. But we do often do a tendon transfer on one side and a nerve transfer on the other. And guess what? The nerve transfer is done on the better side. Um, we don't use biceps to triceps because biceps is a supinator and that means that I can't use supinator as a nerve donor and it's a really key nerve donor. The advantages of nerve transfers for triceps is that it's a smaller incision just in the armpit. Um, it's a sling for seven to ten days. In our unit it's, a, a, it's eight weeks in a brace, Bledsoe brace, so some units it's less, uh, maybe up to maybe six weeks and there's no tender donor, donor site, and it's easy to do both sides. We use the Terry's minor as our first choice, but then we will use the posterior division of the auxiliary, or even both, um, if we feel that the Terry's minor isn't quite up to the job, if it's not stimulating quite as well as we'd like. And <clears throat> the deltoid to triceps is always available for salvage. Um, I always check when I stimulate the anterior division of the um, axillary nerve to make sure, before I do the transfer, to make sure that it is stimulating the posterior deltoid really well. And then I feel confident that I have to come back and do a deltoid to triceps, which I have had to do, um, that I can successfully then reconstruct elbow extension with a standard tendon transfer. So I'm showing a little bit of elbow extension with um, a weight in his hand. Wrist extension, this is the C5, um, International, International Classification 1 uh, patient. Now this patient you have brachioradialis as a tendon transfer and supinator as, nerve, as a nerve donor, so you can choose. If, if 
I, I always try and give, if I, I see wrist is recovering, wrist extension is recovering, I'm, this is the one time I really, I really want to give it whatever time it needs. If I think it's going to get there, I will wait. I don't, I, if you can get wrist back without a reconstruction, it gives you much more option in terms of um, your, your reconstruction of grasp and pinch. It, is, it remains the key to your hand function. So brachial radialis to ECRB as a tendon transfer is very reliable and that's what I go to, but it's not always a good excursion. Supinator to ECRB is a better excursion, but it takes away my supinator as a, as a donor um, for grasp and pinch. I have used a weak, which you're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to use a, a, a muscle that's less than an MRC grade of four as a tendon transfer, or, and especially not a nerve transfer, but I have used a weak supinator and a weak BR. Uh, to try and get wrist extension just over the line and um, it's, I've done in four patients and I've, it's worked in two so I'm not advocating for that but sometimes it can be just an edge over the line. Hand opening so the spin has just completely revolutionized hand opening and, and uh, you know we, we always try and do a spin whenever we can but if you are trying to reconstruct grasp and pinch and the only donor you have is a supinator, then don't put it into your spin. You have to put it into grasp and pinch. That is, that's a prior, it's further up the, the ranking in terms of priorities. Never ever use a spin to try and reconstruct wrist extension because the hand will just pull up like that and you'll never be able to, even a tenodesis grasp will be difficult. You must have independent wrist extension before you use a spin to uh, create extension in the fingers and the thumb. Um, also, even if you are going to, you've got a plan to, to reconstruct grass and pinch, say you use a brachialis to AIN and it's a high level patient and then you put a spin in, if your brachialis to AIN doesn't work and you've got your spin working, you're up the creek and you don't have a salvage. So be very careful, you've got to know that your grasp and pinch is going to work before you put your spin in. Hands open better with a spin if nerve transfers have been used to reconstruct grasp and pinch, and this is advantageous in the day and age of using electronic devices. The PIP joints extend better after a spin when there's no spasticity. I've got a video to show you uh, later. In spasticity, you can still extend the MCP joints quite well with the spin, but not really the PIP joints. And the ability to use the hand is not just about release and getting your hand around objects to grasp. It's about using the hand in the open position. And I'm really wanting a therapist to come up to me after one of the, when I start talking about this after the talk and say, can, I, can, I, can we talk about designing an outcome measure to measure the use of the hand in the open position? Because this is how we interact with other humans. We don't, we don't uh, interact, well, as we do, but that's not good. We're not <laughs> encouraging violence. So we, we interact like this. We touch, we, we shake hands, we touch ourselves like this. We wash our hair, we wash our bodies. And then almost everything we do is hand open, you know, when we're using electronic devices. So it's really important. And we mustn't think of it as just the opposite of grasp. Okay, we use a supinated a pin transfer via an anterior approach. And and, and here's a, a slide that I've put up many times before. It's showing the hand in the resting position and it's our first 10 spins that we did. Um, and then with the spin activated. Um, and you can see it's not always good. Um, some patients have got spasticity, some don't, but all of them have more hand opening than they did uh, in, in the resting position. So that would have been their maximum extension pre-op. And they, we don't just operate on left hands. Um, that's just mirror image, so you can see it. This man's had a triple nerve transfer, so he's got grasp and pinch, elbow extension and hand opening, and he doesn't have any spasticity. So that's, he's got nice grasp and a nice hand opening. But this man does have spasticity. I've not reconstructed his grasp. This is, he's, he's an incomplete, but he has had a spin. And you can see the spin kind of struggling against the, the, the tone. And then no extension at the PIPJs. Hand opening without a spin, we go back to um, Moberg's tenodesis. Okay, so we still have that if we need it, if you, don't, if you don't have a spin to put in and you are reconstructing grasp and pinch, um, either with a nerve or with the tendons, you do have the ability to stabilize extension in that, in that uh, classic way. With grasp and pinch, we need to 
deliberately we need to use or deliberately reserve all our nerve and tendon donors okay something is always better than nothing brachialis to AIN is less reliable in the higher level patient the problem is is that's when we're wanting to use it um, so sometimes we do it because that's all we got um, but if you can do a distal nerve transfer um, please do align your reconstruction with the patient's goals Consider doing different reconstructions in the two hands, focusing on grasp in one hand and pinch in the other if you're doing both a tendon, tendon transfers on both sides, or maybe a nerve transfer for grasp and pinch on one side so you've got a more open hand, and then a, and then a tendon transfer for grasp and pinch on the other side so you've potentially got a stronger hand. Use double, dis, double nerve transfers for grasp, so um, the ECRB to AIN and a pronator teres to FDS. Whenever you're reconstructing um, pinch, you always do a stabilization of the IPJ. We knew that from tendons. I tried to, do, to not do that with nerves because I wasn't sure if we needed it. I can tell you you need it. You don't need to do that experiment yourself. When you do a nerve transfer to AIN, if something's not going to work, it's normally the thumb. So FPL is often more denervated than the finger flexors. So if you're, if you're worried about it working, you might put your BR into the thumb straight away as well, or you might hold your BR in reserve and add it in for either grasp or pinch if you want to augment grasp or pinch after your nerve transfers had a time to land. Um, you can reroute uh, brachial radialis through the interosseous membrane to simultaneously reconstruct pronation when you're using it as a tendon transfer. And you can, should consider a simultaneous passive uh, intrinsic reconstruction or otherwise do it as a second stage. This was the, the sort of algorithm. Patients that are IC1, they need wrist extension. So your, your, your starting point is you're, you're either, and what I've highlighted is generally what I would, would be my, my go-to. Um, I tend to use brachial radialis into wrist extension. And so then that leaves me supinator to put into AIN. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not trying to reconstruct hand opening. The, uh, there is another option of putting, put, you could say, well, why don't you just put brachialis to AIN? You know, then you don't, you can still do your spin. The problem is I'm not happy that, I'm not confident that my brachialis to AIN is going to work and then I'm going to be up the creek with a great spin and no grasp and pinch. Your other option is to put supinator into your wrist extensor as a nerve transfer. And then um, you can use uh, brachial radialis either into grasp or pinch on one side or the other. Uh, or you could use a brachialis to AIN and augment as needed with your reserved um, BR. In the IC2, you've got limited options for grasp and pinch, but you've got wrist extension. I tend to do the same though. I, I just put my supinator into AIN and I say no spin. I know it's going to open better because it's, I can still have got that wrist flexion um, and soft hand opening because I've put a nerve in for grasp and pinch. And I've got my brachial radialis. So I can augment that. I can augment pinch either straight away if I'm worried that my, um, the, the FPL is denervated, or I can see how it goes and put it in later. Your other options again, brachialis into AIN, and you've got a little bit of a backup in with your brachial radialis, which you didn't have before. Or you can put brachialis in just into FDS and put uh, your BR straight into your thumb. Or you can do the tendon transfer. You've got one brachial radialis. You can put it into thumb on the one side and grasp on the other, and Tina D's the other flexor. See, when you get to IC3, you've got more options for grasp and pinch. And ECRB potentially comes into play at this level, but please don't use it unless you are 100% sure that your ECRB is working perfectly. And in this classification level, um, for me, there has to be at least some pronation. It's not, it's not uh, MRC4, so we haven't got to IC4 yet, but there's something there. It's, maybe it's a 3. And so I feel a bit more confident that ECRB is working. And it's not because using ECRB is going to result in any uh, functional uh, deficit. It's just that your nerve transfer isn't going to work, you know, because you've still got ECRL. You're not going to mess with wrist extension by using it. It's just not going to work very well. But at this level, remember that you also have your standard tendon transfers available to you. And so, you know, you might go, you know what, not 100% sure about ECRB. I'm going to stick with tendons or I'm going to do nerves on one side because I'm happy on one side and I'm going to do tendons on the other. Once you get down here, 
um, to the next level, I'm inclined to either do nerves on both sides and see how we go and then augment with a, with a brachioradialis uh, if needed later, um, or do tendon transfers on one side and nerves on the other for grasp and pinch. This patient is going to tell you about having nerve transfers on one side and, grasp and, and tendons on the other. So Rob, you have had um, tendon transfers for grasp and pinch in your right hand and nerve transfers for grasp and pinch in your left hand. Can you tell me which of those um, hands you prefer? I prefer my left hand to pick objects up. If I'm to pick up something round or even bigger, I use my left hand, slipping like mm -hmm. this. Um, predominantly my index finger and thumb and my ring finger does a bit of the work. Yep. Uh, on my right, when I have to sign my name, I can grab a pen because of that pinch that yep. I have. But I yep. have a lot of tone in my right hand, which is preventing me from being able to pick some objects up, but mm -hmm. there is a lot of strength in this hand. Okay. Um, I can hold a toothbrush confidently, yep. um, which I couldn't do before. Yes. And I can use normal cutlery, which I use with my left hand, which I couldn't do before. I can throw a ball to my kids, either overarm or underarm which I can only do with this left hand mm -hmm. because of the ability to open my hand. Um, so he's not had anything, we haven't given him anything for grasp, but really you can see the incredible hand opening that you get with a spin procedure. So just to talk briefly about stabilizing and positioning procedures that are very important, you need to stabilize the interphalangeal joint of the thumb for all thumb reanimations. We don't usually need a CMC joint fusion anymore for the thumb um, with the spin. The spin gives you a really incredible web, first web space opening, you know, 10 centimeters for, worth of first web space opening. So, um, I mean, that might not, doesn't, you know, that still gets you, that gets you around a lot of stuff. You don't need to necessarily be as sort of um, palmar abducted as we, as we used to be. Intrinsic plasty, it's hard to know with nerves whether someone's going to need an intrinsic plasty or not. Um, so I often keep it as a secondary procedure, but then, but then I look at my results and I go, God, I wish I'd done a house procedure or MCPJ uh, capsulodesis. And then I say to the patient, how about we do that? And they say, how about no? So um, it's so hard to, uh, it is a, it's a, it's, I still haven't been able to work out how you predict who's going to need it and who, and who doesn't. So this patient is showing that sort of intrinsic minus position of the hand. He's missing with his thumb a bit there too. He needs to have his, his NZ split improved. But it's kind of hard to, you know, even though he's very intrinsic minus, you know, he's, he's able to really span his hand and get it around. And that's quite a heavy block that he's picking up as well. Mostly it's spasticity that we, we see it in the elbow, wrist and finger flexors. Spasticity in the finger flexors may be beneficial and uh, in the initial stages you want to potentially do a little bit of stretching to maintain the muscular tendinous length but just you know keeping that balance in the hand so you don't lose the tenodesis. You might try some, if you think it's too tight, you might try some botulinum toxin, I call that try before you buy. Um, and, uh, and then we follow that up if that's useful to the patient, most commonly with fractional lengthening. The, the advantage of the fractional lengthening is that you can then set, the therapist then actually treats the patient with a sort of a, a starting point with that fractional lengthening. You can set either more or less or, uh, you know, stretch on that muscle in the first few weeks with your splint. Um, so the patient can, while they're awake and functional, actually determine how much length they need on that muscle because you've just got that ability to modify it with a splint. And so this patient is showing, uh, his left hand is pre-op and he's, sorry, not a great photo, but he's, he's, he's showing his hand opening on the right after he's had fractional lengthening. Um, and, and he's actually even flexing his wrist down even slightly on the left to try and get his hand opening. But already you can see the improvement in the hand opening. And then on the, on the other photo, uh, on, on your right, um, he pulls his wrist up into extension to try and use his hand and his hand just makes a fist. Whereas when his wrist is in extension on the side that's been operated on, he's still got very nice hand opening. And I won't 
subject you to another video, but that's him explaining uh, the, the difference. And it's really just, you know, he's got hands and he didn't have them before. So in summary, elbow extension, nerve transfers are better in the early patient, lower level, good donor nerve, light limbs, and it's preferred by patients if they qualify because of the fact that they don't need the brace. Wrist extension, you do what makes you most comfortable. Either, um, uh, you know, your ECRB uh, as, a, as, a, as a nerve transfer or your brachioradialis as a tendon. With hand opening, do a spin when you can, but only when you've got independent wrist extension and a reliable option for grasp and pinch. Grasp and pinch, your choice of reconstruction depends on the international classification level. Consider doing different reconstructions in each hand to overall increase the number of functions a patient can do. Use distal nerve transfers, double them up if you can. Um, in terms of intrinsic and balancing procedures, always do an IPJ stabilization. Um, and uh, warn the patient of the need for a possible secondary um, intrinsic plasty. And in terms of spasticity, it may be beneficial, that tone in the finger flexors. Try before you buy with botulinum toxin and then preferably fractionally lengthen and splint to get them to the level that they want to be. Thank you.